Now I move on to questions for the Minister of Justice. I call, uh, can I first of all welcome the Minister to her first question time, and I call Mr. Daphne Mackay. Uh, I uh, thank the Speaker for his kind sentiments. Um, to answer question number one, uh, my department's community safety strategy contains a commitment to tackling all forms of hate crime and the harm it causes through prevention, awareness, education and support for victims and communities. To deliver on this commitment, my department chairs a multi-agency hate crime delivery group which takes forward a range of actions to combat hate crime from the criminal justice perspective. The PSNI hold membership of this group and are engaged in a number of specific initiatives alongside my department. These include the Hate Crime Advocacy Service, joint funded by my department and the PSNI, which provides a consistent point of contact for uh, victims who require advice, support and assistance on a practical and emotional level. Dedicated bilingual advocates to assist victims of racial hate crime are engaged through the service. Um, the Hate Incident Practi Practical Action Scheme, which is funded by my department, the PSNI, the Northern Ireland Housing Executive and the Department for Communities. This scheme can provide victims of hate crime with personal protection and safety measures to help them feel safer in their homes. My officials and PSNI officers have also recently participated in the Good Practice Plus, which is a Europe-wide Europe project led by the Northern Ireland Council for Ethnic Minorities. The project facilitates sharing and embedding of best practice in tackling hate, uh, hate crime right across a range of operational agencies in, in uh, countries involved. More broadly, my department will be working with the Executive Office to take forward the aspects of the Executive's racial equality strategy relating to racist hate crime. This work will form part of addressing the wider societal issues that ultimately manifest through racial hate crime. At a local level, policing and community safety partnerships deliver targeted projects including initiatives to influence the attitudes of young people with a view to increasing awareness of diversity and difference. Mr Mackay for a supplementary. Can I, can I thank the Minister for her answer and can I recognise that, that uh, much uh, of the work that is, uh, is ongoing. Uh, but given the recent uh, reported and alleged uh, race crime within the Minister's own constituency, involving several members of the police. Will the minister give us an assurance that a proper and fully ind independent investigation will be carried out uh, into that? And does she also agree uh, that we need to ensure that there is zero tolerance of racism across all of our services? I thank the member for his uh, supplementary. Um, I am aware of the recent incident which happened within my own constituency regarding the actions of off-duty PSNI officers in Port Stewart, and it had been reported that the PSNI are looking into a hate crime element of that. Um, in terms of investigating this matter, it is an operational matter for the PSNI. Um, if the member has any concerns, I would suggest that he takes it directly to them. Um, I will say this, though, that there should be no uh, no, uh, zero tolerance in all incidents of hate crime, whether it be racial or sectarian, and certainly my department is something that we're keen to, uh, to uh, support in that respect. Call Ms. Jenny Palmer. And uh, thank the Minister for her answer. Um, does the Minister share my concern that some of the rhetoric employed by some people in the debate on Brexit has the potential to encourage racism and increase race-hate crime? Is she confident that the law is sufficiently robust to deal with the minority of people who think it's acceptable to spread race-hate via social media? Um, I thank the member for her question, and indeed I, I, I entirely agree with that sentiment. I think the language that we use, whether it's in, re, in respect of Brexit or in, indeed any uh, issue that we talk on, is very important. I think, particularly as politicians, we do have a responsibility to ensure that the words we use don't instil any sort of hate within people in terms of who they're directed at. Um, in, in terms of the, the legislation that, that, that looks at that, um, I think in some of the initiatives that my department is, is um, involved with, we are trying to tackle that. But you know, I, you know, I do certainly take the point that there could be more that needs to be done, and I'm quite happy to engage with the member to, to, to hopefully maybe see a way forward in that respect. Call Ms. Nicola Mallon. Um, I welcome the Minister's unequivocal um, statement that there should be a zero tolerance approach to all race or all hate crime. Can I ask, does she share the view that legislation in this mandate for equal marriage in Northern Ireland can help to develop a more tolerant, inclusive and respectful society here? 
Um, I thank the, the member for her uh, supplementary. Indeed, you know, I, I think it's uh, been well established that I would certainly support equal marriage and um, certainly I would try and have those conversations with my executive colleagues. In respect of that particular uh, topic, it doesn't really fall within my remit, but by, by all means, that's, you know, as an executive, we're there to discuss, to discuss uh, the issues and um, it's something that I'm quite keen to do and have said from the outset as a minister I will try and do that. Call Mr. Colum Eastwood. With permission, Mr. Speaker, I will take questions two and ten together. Um, I welcome the work of the Lord Chief Justice has undertaken in terms of developing his uh, proposal for the completion of 56 outstanding legacy cases and have discussed with him the urgent need for funding to be made available under the terms of the Stormont House and Fresh Start agreements to enable him to do so. My predecessor submitted a proposal covering funding for legacy inquests, inquests over the initial 19-month period to the former executive, but this was not included on the agenda prior to the election. Without resolving the issues of uh, resourcing the investigations into outstanding trouble-related deaths, we are failing the families of victims. And I am committing to making progress on this matter and will, um, in due course, be uh, discussing this with the First Minister, the Deputy First Minister and my executive colleagues. Call Mr. Declan Kearney. Can I get a supplement? Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Um, thank the, the, the Minister for her answer. I think she, she understands the fact that uh, so many families have been waiting for far too long uh, and shouldn't have to wait any longer, given the fact that we're at the point where we're able to do something about some of these cases. Um, she said in due course she'll be meeting with her executive colleagues. Would she agree with me that this is a matter of utmost urgency? And the executive need to make a decision urgently uh, to make sure that we can request the funds that are drawn down to allow the Lord Chief Justice to do the job that he began uh, in advance of this mandate. I thank the member for his uh, supplementary. Um, yes, I do agree with you. I think it is a matter of urgency that we approach this issue. And indeed, I have had initial discussions with the First Minister and Deputy First Minister without going into, into any sort of specific detail. But I am confident that as an executive, we will approach this issue and we will do it sooner rather than later. So it's really about having those discussions and trying to, figure, um, to ensure that we move forward in the best way. But yes, I, you know, I do agree, agree with the member, Mr. Speaker. These families have waited far too long. And the reality is these legacy inquests will go ahead while they're within five years or within 25 years and I think we do owe it to uh, the victims and the families uh, of those uh, victims to try and do it sooner rather than later so that we can actually start dealing with the past uh, in a way of moving forward. Call Mr Declan Kearney. Can Corlea agus Guillaume Gach Racht on Ara and St Arach Dúr Shugat. Thank you Speaker and may I welcome the uh, Minister into her uh, new portfolio. Does the Minister recognise that the continued refusal by the British government to lift its veto on maximum information disclosure in relation to matters of the past is an increasing source of anger and concern within the wider community. I uh, thank uh, the member for his kind sentiments and uh, for his uh, supplementary. I think there are significant challenges in, in terms of dealing with legacy issues and with the past and certainly in, in able to move forward um, it, it is discussions that we're having within the executive and something that we, we do have to have with people outside of the executive um, but it, by all means, you know, I am committed to, to ensuring that we do that. And if there are concerns in terms of the challenges that we face, I am I'm more than happy to listen to them and see if there's a way around those uh, challenges. Can I just remind the members, if they wish to ask a question, that they continually rise in their place. Call Mr David. Mr Speaker, can I also welcome the Minister to her first question time. In response to the question from Mr Eastwood, the supplementary, uh, the Minister said, having met the First Minister and Deputy First Minister, she was confident we would make progress on this matter in a short time. Given the fact that the First Minister and Deputy First Minister failed to place this on the executive agenda previous to the election, given that they failed to allow me as Minister then to take an urgent decision, could she explain on what basis she is confident, please? <clears throat> I, uh, I thank the, the member for his question and indeed I want to put on record my thanks to the work he has done up until now. Certainly a lot of the detail that I've been put over in my department does allude to his work as Justice Minister so I just want to put that on record. Um, I am uh, confident Mr Speaker that um, we will be able to find a solution to this problem. I think what different, the difference between myself and my predecessor is that I do enjoy a level of support from the First Minister and Deputy First Minister in a way that perhaps was, was not possible for him as a member of a political party. Um, and 
certainly I am confident moving forward. You know, I, I think it's no secret that the, the First Minister and Deputy First Minister and the, the wider executive have committed to, particularly in this mandate, in working together. And um, I'm confident we can do that. Of course, there will be challenges in being able to do that. But, you know, I, I think right now Northern Ireland needs an indication that we're about getting things done and moving forward. And in terms of addressing this legacy issue, I, I'm, I'm confident that we will do that. Call Mr. Raymond McCann. Would the Minister agree, Mr Speaker, that while the uh, matters that we are now talking about are commonly presented in this chamber and in this part of the world, sort of as difficulties arising from two hostile communities sort of having grievances uh, going back a number of years, isn't it the fact that when representatives of the state murder its citizens, and this is not that to call for the truth to be told without recourse to uh, concepts such as national security. Does she agree that this is not a nationalist issue, but a democratic issue, because the state must be held to account when it kills its citizens? <clears throat> I, uh, I thank the, the member for his question. Um, in terms of the, the, the issue that you raise, you know, I, I do think we need to look at all aspects. You know, I, I do actually agree that there is a sense that there need, we need to look at truth, and it needs to come from all sides. Certainly as Justice Minister, I won't be uh, concentrating on one particular community. I will be looking at all aspects. And if there are concerns as yours such as raised, then I, I'm quite happy to take them forward and try and address them in the best way we can. In order to, to move forward, there does need to be a sense of truth, and I think let, let's have those honor, honest conversations so we can move forward. I call Mr. Sammy Douglas. Your question number three, please. <laughs> I very much welcome the report um, by the independent three-person panel and would like to take this opportunity to place on record my th thanks for their hard work and commitment in producing a comprehensive report. The report represents a positive way forward for dealing with this very difficult issue. When we published the report, we committed to publish an action plan setting out how we will work together to take forward the recommendations. The recommendations in the report are wide-ranging and complex, and associated actions will need to span much wider than the simply, simply issues of uh, policing and uh, justice. My department is coordinating work across all executive departments and with the relevant cr criminal justice agencies to prepare an action plan based on the recommendations and the commitments in Section A of the Fresh Start Agreement. The action plan will come to the executive for approval and we will publish it in due course. Call Mr. Sammy Douglas for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And could I also um, uh, welcome the, the Minister to her, her first question time and I wish her all the best. Um, could I ask the Minister, and considering the panel recommendations on the addressing of the barriers to disbandment um, of the, the paramilitary um, organisation, um, what is her view on that? I uh, thank the, the member for his supplementary and his kind wishes. Um, the panel set out in its report what it identified as barriers to the disbanding of paramilitary groups and ways in which these might be addressed. And I fully appreciate, as I'm sure the member will as well, that these are difficult and quite sensitive uh, matters. We are in the process of actually putting together our action plan and we are considering recommendations carefully and we will set out our response in due course. Call Mr. Alex Atwood. Coach Seamus Mallon in uh, what he said to the first Oversight Commissioner for Patton. I, I wish you all the best, Minister, for now. Um, could, I ask, could I ask the Minister is it the case that six months after Fresh Start, not one penny of Fresh Start monies have been released to the PSNI and the NCA to tackle the threat of organised crime in Northern Ireland and on these islands? And when will monies be released to the PSNI for that purpose? I uh, thank the, the member for his uh, supplementary and indeed his good wishes. Um, I, I wish him the best for always because I'm that type of person. <laughs> Um, I, I do appreciate the comments that the member has raised and certainly um, in respect of the monies uh, being released there does need to be a political agreement on that um, and I, you know, I think it is critical that we move forward in doing that and um, from my perspective as um, who, who, leading the, the Justice Department I am keen to ensure that we do have that political agreement and seeing how we can move forward so those monies can be released. You know, as I had mentioned in my earlier response to legacy inquests, these problems will occur. Um, and you know we're not going to, you know they're not going to go away. And in terms of moving forward, we do need to deal with that. And certainly, um, I, as Justice Minister, I am committed in ensuring that we start addressing them. Call Ms. Jennifer McCann. Well, yeah. 
Can I also welcome the Minister to her first question time? And can I ask her, you know, will she join with me in commending the important work of community restorative justice schemes as acknowledged in paragraph 4.16 of the panel report, and particularly the role of um, Community Restorative Justice Ireland? And can I ask her, would she agree with the recommendation that the executive should put in place a dedicated fund to provide enhanced resource over a longer period for this type of work? I uh, thank the member for her uh, again kind wishes and um, uh, supplementary question. Um, but by all means, I, I do commend the work of all sort of community and voluntary uh, sectors in terms of tackling diff different aspects uh, within justice and, and you know, the wider uh, public service. Um, I think they do play an important role. Um, I'm a big advocate of the community and voluntary sector from the perspective that these people are best placed to understand and to facilitate their communities. Um, and certainly, um, it's something that within my department, I will be looking at other ways that we can actually facilitate the community and voluntary sector into trying to deal with these problems that are very close to home. Well, Ms. Rosemary Barton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I welcome the Justice Minister to our first question time? Does the Justice Minister have any concerns at the ability of the Executive to work towards the disbandment of paramilitary groups, given the intimate relationship between one of the Executive parties with the main and still existing paramilitary organisations in Northern Ireland, namely PIRA, and the history of the other party? and flirting with other paramilitaries over the many years, for example, the Ulster resistance. I, uh, I thank the member for her kind wishes and for her uh, supplementary. Um, as in my response to, to Mr. Douglas, um, I appreciate that these are difficult and sensitive uh, matters, but you know, it's a case of trying to move Northern Ireland forward. And, and I think in order to do that, we need to start addressing these issues quite honestly. And, if that means engaging with people, then we, we have to do that. But by all means, it's not justifying their existence. It's about being part of the process so that we can move Northern Ireland forward. I'm of a generation now that wants to see things uh, being done in Northern Ireland. And um, certainly, you know, I'm a representative of people. And if that means that I can contribute some way in trying to move Northern Ireland forward, then, you know, we have to take these difficult decisions. That's why people put us in this chamber to represent them so that we can make decisions on their behalf. You know, and I'm quite happy to do that in, in terms of uh, trying to have a better outcome for Northern Ireland. Call Mr. Chris Lill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, the report on ending paramilitary activity uh, states that tackling segregation will be vital to building a society where paramilitarism no longer exists and recommends ambitious targets and milestones to measurably reduce segregation in education and housing. Can I ask the Minister, therefore, what she believes is an ambitious target for increasing integrated education and what actions she will be proposing as a member of the Executive to deliver this outcome? Okay. I thank the, the member for his uh, question. I'm familiar um, that the member has an interest in this area in terms of integrated education. Um, I do think generally it's something that we should be moving towards. Um, uh, forgive me, but I'm not over the detail of my department and I haven't yet come to a conclusion what my priorities will be moving forward. But um, I do realise that these conversations again need to be had. And you know, it, it, it's not just about adults having these conversations, it's about bringing kids along with us to ensure that we don't find ourselves in a situation where, you know, where, where our communities are segregated. But um, certainly, um, given uh, the member's interest in this particular area, you know, I, I would certainly you know, welcome a conversation with him to see how he feels that you know, we, we could maybe broach this subject because, as I said, I haven't quite set my priorities yet, but um, as some members have already uh, will be aware, I am inviting all political parties, including smaller political parties, to come forward with their ideas around justice so that I can see if it could form part of my own priorities moving uh, forward in the next five years. Call Mr. Gordon Dunn. Question four, please. <clears throat> Legal aid is demand-led and, and expenditure fluctuates depending on the volume of cases and the complexity and outcomes of those cases. The spend on legal aid in 2015-16 financial year was £92 million. The total spend was affected by with the withdrawal of services in the Crown Court by barristers which reduced the number of cases completed last year. The reforms that have been introduced, including the introduction of standard fees in the criminal courts and the removal of a very high cost cases, will, will realise savings of some £19 million per annum when fully implemented. The first of the reforms introduced in the civil courts relating to the authorisation of counsel have already delivered savings in excess of one million. Further reforms will be brought forward this financial year. In particular, standard fees for family proceeding cases will be brought forward to replace the current system. It is estimated that this will realise savings of three million per annum. 
Proposals for changes to the scope of uh, civil legal aid will also be brought before the Assembly later this year, aimed at delivering further savings. Mr Dunn, for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I too thank the, the Minister for her answers, and I wish her well in her new post. In relation to the Northern Ireland Office Audit Report, which I have in front of me here, which was released today, recommendation 8 on page 37 mentions the need for the agency to embed its counter-fraud strategy. Will the Minister give us an assurance today that she will use her influence on the agency to establish a reliable estimate of the value of fraud in the legal aid system and take further steps to build an effective counter-fraud culture within the agency? I thank Mr Dunn for his uh, supplementary. Um, he will appreciate that the report, report was published this morning and I will take time to consider it carefully. Um, I do welcome the, uh, the fact that the report acknowledges that progress has been made and we are continuing to deliver on a reform programme which has not been fully implemented. Um, my, uh, indeed, um, uh, the member will be aware that my officials will be uh, uh, speaking of the report in, when they next meet with the committee. Um, and indeed, again, I acknowledge the role of the Comptroller and Audit General to scrutinise my department's progress against these recommendations made previously. Call Mr Robin Swan. Thank you very much. Mr Speaker, um, Minister, can I welcome you to your new position on the opposition benches? But the legal services agency's accounts have been qualified since 2003. Is the Minister hopeful that that qualification will be removed for the 1516 account? <clears throat> Um, I, I thank the member for his question and I too uh, welcome his uh, kind wishes from the opposition benches and I, I wish them well in doing that. Um, d uh, forgive me, um, I, I'm not over the detail of, of what you've discussed but certainly I'm quite happy to write to the member and come back to you on an answer with that. Call Mr Trevor Lunn. Uh, thank you Mr Speaker. Uh, can I also welcome the Minister to her first question time. Uh, un under the current legal services legislation the agency doesn't have any powers to carry out inspections in the Office of Legal Representatives. Is the Minister satisfied with that or is it something she might look at? I uh, thank uh, Mr Lunn again for his kind wishes and uh, for um, his supplementary question. Um, again, I'm not familiar with the detail with that, but I will, I will come back to you with an answer. Okay, thank you. Call Mr Jim Allister. Question five. Um, first, Mr Speaker, I would like to express publicly my sympathy for the families on the loss of their loved ones. The 5th of January 1976 was one of the most tragic days in the history of the Troubles, where 10 workers were singled out on their way home from work and gone down. Therefore, the holding of an inquest some 40 years on is a, is a welcome development for the families, albeit far too long. The Kingsmill inquest opened on the 23rd of May 2016 before His Honour Judge Sherrard. On the 31st of May, the coroner received correspondence from the Crown Solicitor indicating that new evidence had come to light, insomuch as a match had been identified for a palm print found on a vehicle that had been thought, thought to be involved in the attack. The families were apprised of this development on the same day. Following submissions from legal representatives, the inquest continued on the 8th of June that has been adjourned until today. I recognise the importance of the inquest system to deliver a proper and robust investigation into the deaths that resulted from this atrocity. And like the families, I welcome the fact that a new investigative avenue has been identified and this must be fully explored. As the conduct of the ongoing inquest is a matter for the coroner and the police investigation is an operational matter for the chief constable, it would not be appropriate for me to comment further at this stage. Mr Alistair for a supplementary. The Minister had no difficulty making advert comments about the Brexit campaign, but she seems a little more reticent on a, an inquest which falls under her jurisdiction. Surely, as Minister, it would be legitimate and appropriate for her to seek explanation as to how palm prints which have been in the possession of forensics for years and examined multiple times were only identified after the inquest started and with the consequence of the, uh, of the delay in the inquest. What does it say of the probity and the thoroughness of previous investigations that this situation has evolved? And is she satisfied with that? And what steps have been taken to rectify such situations in the future? 
I uh, thank the member for his supplementary and would perhaps draw um, his attention to my comments on Brexit and the language that we use in terms of trying to move Northern Ireland forward. Um, the police investigation is a live investigation. At this stage, I cannot comment on the timeline for the conclusion of the investigation or any elements within it. Call Mr. Pachian. Uh, and I'd also like to wish the Minister well in her new post. Uh, and, uh, I would like to ask her, does she agree with me that the urgent establishment of all the mechanisms for dealing with the past, as agreed under the Fresh Start Agreement, um, provide the best opportunity to secure maximum truth, recovery and justice for all families and individuals who suffered as a result of the conflict? Um, I thank the member for his kind wishes and his supplementary. Um, Yes, I, I do agree. Um, I think we do need to move forward in terms of uh, dealing with the past, whether that's with the legacy inquest or the historical investigations unit. And you know, I, I, I do think you know cases such as they do, do demonstrate the need for doing that, and uh, to finally give uh, victims and their families some sort of uh, response to something that they've been dealing with for, for, for many, many years. Well, Mr. Jonathan Bell. Can I uh, congratulate the Minister? It's the first time to do that in the House and welcome her taking a very courageous decision on what is a very difficult post and we wish you well within that. But the Minister will be aware that the uh, Kingsmill massacre uh, is a festering sore that until justice is done will never lead to a proper reconciliation and healing in our, in our society. And can the Minister assure the House because there is a scepticism about the provisional IRA's involvement in what was a sectarian massacre akin to what we have seen in Kosovo and other horrendous areas. That no stone will be left unturned in seeking that justice. And that if the provisional IRA are found to be responsible by due process of law, they will be held to account for what was a heinous sectarian atrocity. Um, uh, I thank the member for his uh, good wishes and um, for his supplementary. Um, and I, I do recognise that this was an atrocity, and it is something. It's a journey that you know will not end with whatever the outcome of this uh, inquest is. Um, indeed, a lot of inquests, uh, the outstanding ones that we need to take forward, um, hopefully sooner rather than later, again, you know, a very very similar impact on the families and the victims. You know, um, in, in terms of uh, this inquest and holding people to account, well, that is a matter for the coroner, and any investigation with the police is again an operational matter. So it is difficult for me to comment. Um, but um, I, I will say that. Moving Moving forward, it is something that we need to address, and we need to do it sooner rather than later. Call Mr. Colin McGrath. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, does the minister fully accept the content and the findings of the re police ombudsman's report into the Lock and Island murders? Um, does she agree with me that the remarks made by the Secretary of State were unhelpful and deeply uh, disrespectful to the families and the victims? Um, I thank the, the member for his question. Um, again, the Lock and Island report um, is, is a, an, an operational matter for the PSNI, so it, it is again difficult for me to make comment on that. But I will say this, in uh, 1994, six men didn't come home, and that's a travesty. You know, and whilst this report um, might provide some comfort to the families, those, that journey that they are on will not end. And I, I think this is an indication of a lot of these types of uh, inquests across Northern Ireland. Um, and again, you know, you know, as I said in, in a previous question, I think we do, to an extent, need to be careful in how we you know, put these things and be very mindful of the fact that there are victims here. And I think um, moving forward again, it's something um, in working with my executive colleagues, it's something that I do seek to address sooner rather than later so that Northern Ireland can move on and so that we are dealing with the past uh, in the most appropriate way. Call Ms Paula Bradshaw. Thank you, um, Mr. Speaker. Um, can I ask the, the Justice Minister, does she agree that the investigation into Kings Mill demonstrated the need for a robust system for investigating the past and what negotiations she's involved in to establish institutions to do this? Thank you. Um, uh, yes, I, I, I do agree that it demonstrates that as other um, events are you know, um, inevitably going to come before us. Um, and indeed, again, you know, just to reiterate, I am you know, speaking with my executive colleagues and, and trying to seek a way forward on trying to deal with these types of issues. I call Mr. Alan Chambers. Question six, Mr. Speaker. 
The issue of addressing antisocial behaviour at Coffersburg and Country Park is an operational matter for the Chief Constable, who is accountable to the Northern Ireland Policing Board. I can let you know, however, that addressing antisocial behaviour is a strategic objective for all policing and community safety partnerships, and the Arden North Down uh, partnership has set aside over £95,000 to address this issue this year. I can also advise that in May 2016, TransLink, Ards and North Down Council, Lisburn and Castle Ray Council and PSNI ran a joint operation for five consecutive weeks which helped reduce antisocial behaviour at Crawfordburn Beaches and County Park. As a result of this joint operation, calls to the Police Service of Northern Ireland for their services were drastically reduced. Police Service of Northern Ireland, which is also a designated member of the Policing and Community Safety Partnership, has robust measures in place to deal with any antisocial behaviour incidents in the park, including a ban on alcohol. The Ards and North Down Policing District Command Unit has also developed an effective collaborative working relationship with TransLink, the Council and the Northern Ireland Environment Agency, who will manage the park, and there will be ongoing monitoring to ensure everyone enjoys facilities at the park over the summer months. I regret, Mr Chambers, there is no time for a supplementary. That ends the period of time for listed questions. We now move on to topical questions, and I call Mr. Steve Aiken. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to congratulate the Minister on her appointment and also on the assured manner in which she's answered questions on this first uh, question time. And I thank you very much indeed, Minister, for that. Uh, my, first, my question is to ask the Minister has she received a security briefing about the recent explosives find in North Belfast last night? Um, I, uh, I, I thank the, minister, or the member uh, for his uh, kind remarks and again I welcome him to the Assembly and I, indeed I look forward to working him, with him on any issues he wishes to raise with me in respect of my justice remit. Um, yes, I, I have received a briefing about the, the suspected explosive material that had have, um, that have been taken out of circulation um, last night. Um, those who uh, have explosive really do have no regard for public safety and they do not uh, conduct anything with care. And in fact, they're, they're intent is uh, to, to just cause havoc and um, unfortunately that you know this can cause injury or, or killing. Um, I, I do actually also find it very incomprehensible that these um, uh, explosive material was found within a residential area um, and you know again just reiterate the fact that there really can be no justification for this type of action and certainly those who are responsible should be held, uh, should be held to account for their actions. For a supplementary. Uh, I thank the Minister and thank you very much indeed for your comments. Um, would the Minister brief the Assembly when a proper forensic examination of the explosives has taken place, whether, as reported, this is 1.5 kilograms of Semtex and this is whether this is newly acquired or this is part of some historical uh, uh, find of explosives, explosives that should have been long since decommissioned? Um, um, I, I do agree with the member. This is a worrying find. However, in, in terms of brief, briefing the assembly, this is an operational matter for the police to investigate. And I would suggest if he has any questions in, in particular to this um, incident, he should contact them directly. Well, Mr. Cackle Boylan. Yeah, Colonel Margaret, John Corley and I wish the Minister well in the new role. Um, just ask the Minister what her department is doing to work with other agencies to try and address the drug abuse and anti-social behaviour, in particular in the New York Arma area, Armina. As I um, uh, mentioned to other members, um, we have a, a community strategy in, uh, which uh, deals with various agencies in, in tackling this type of abuse, whether it be drug or alcohol abuse. Um, and indeed, we, we work with the PSNI and the local uh, policing uh, community and safety partnerships in trying to do that and other various agencies. So it's something that we do take very seriously. Um, I, I spoke on a debate um, a couple of weeks ago in, in respect of uh, psychoactive substances. Um, but you know, I, I think it's important to note that alcohol can be as damaging um, as any other type of uh, drug or a, a, a legal drug, you know, even in, in terms of uh, prescription drugs. But certainly it's something that my department is committed to. And um, moving forward, you know, we're, keen, we're keen to engage to see if we can stop this type of activity. Well, Mr Boylan, for a supplementary. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Just following on from that, then in relation to assistance for addictions, in, in light of the, the announcement that Armagh Courthouse is to close, um, what services within, what access services can you provide to support people who need assistance with addiction? Go on, Mila Margaret. 
Um, I, I thank the member for his uh, question. Um, the, the member will be familiar that ch uh, legal challenges to the closure of Balmina, Lisbon, Straban uh, were submitted to the High Court in early May. Um, all three applications for leave to appeal were heard on the 16th of June, and leave was granted. Um, now, the substantive appeal hearing will not place, uh, take place until uh, autumn, uh, end of October, I believe. So, it would not be uh, appropriate for me to comment further um, in respect of the closure of these uh, courthouses, um, just while ongoing legal action is in effect. Well, Ms. Kiva, Archibald. Um, can I also join with others in welcoming the Minister to her uh, first question time and wish her luck in her role? Um, following the Minister's visit to McGilligan Prison last week, does she envisage an upgrade of the facilities there in the near future? Margaret. Um, I, I thank the member uh, for her kind wishes. Indeed, I wish to extend my kind uh, wishes uh, to my constituency colleague, um, who, who is um, new, to, new to this House uh, since the recent election. Um, yes, I had a very positive uh, visit to McGilligan, positive in the fact that it was important for me to get out and see my uh, prison estate and to determine you know, what work needs to be done moving forward. Um, I, I think, it, for me, the visit would really did reiterate the fact that you know, um, a refurbishment of McGilligan really needs to take place and certainly prior to my becoming a minister it's certainly something I had advocated for and um, so really moving forward now it's about how I can build on the work of my predecessor in uh, realising the outline business case that has been approved and how we can maybe put the, the appropriate funds in place to try and move that forward. Ms Archibald for a supplementary. I thank the minister for her kind wishes and for her answer. Um, the facilities at McGilligan like you said have long been highlighted as not being fit for purpose would the minister acknowledge that it is important both in terms of rehabilitation of the prisoners and for prison staff to do their jobs effectively that they have adequate facilities? Yes, entirely. Um, you know, I, I do think that we need adequate facilities across our uh, present estate, not just in McGilligan, but, but also in uh, the other facilities within Northern Ireland. And certainly my department is committing and trying to realise that you know, we bring those new facilities forward. And it's really just a case of trying to ensure that the current outline business case is appropriate and how we can uh, move that forward in terms of funding it. Call Mr Trevor Clark. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and like others, can I welcome the Minister to your first question time? Minister, can I ask, uh, in relation to we hear much about uh, proceeds of crime and assets that have been recovered, but what role her department pay, plays within those, uh, those assets? Um, through my department, there is an assets uh, recovery scheme, um, which uh, takes, I suppose, assets that have been recovered and um, then uh, uh, shares them out amongst. Uh, appropriate uh, community and voluntary sector groups, so depending on the crime, it might help with victim, victims of that particular crime. Um, I think it's a really great scheme, actually. Um, I think it's a way of ensuring that crime doesn't pay, but you know, indeed it, it can go back to the victims um, of those particular crimes. Um, so certainly um, through various uh, uh, groups that I sit on, and namely I'm thinking of the, the Organised Crime Task for, Force, which is a multi-agency group which I chair, um, and uh, cross-jurisdictional as well, in terms of um, uh, the assets we recover and then what we do with those. Mr Clark for a supplementary. Thank you very much again, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that uh, answer. Uh, Minister, I, I've been approached recently by someone who's involved with sea cadets in Balamina in relation to assets who's made a, a, a case in relation to, even we've seen recently on television across the water where some boats, boats were, were confiscated. But maybe, Minister, uh, could I suggest to you or could I ask you what more you could do to distribute this information to particular community groups because they do have a valuable role within our communities to make sure that they know that they can avail actually of some of these assets that have been received uh, from your department. Um, I, I thank the, the member for his uh, supplementary. Um, yes, you know, but by all means, I, you know, I do think there's a role in my department, indeed all the departments within the executive, to, to um, better inform, if you like, community and voluntary sector of how they can make use of public funding, particularly in areas such as this. Um, I, I suppose it's one of the aspects of the programme for government that I'm really quite content with, that we have that engagement with the community and voluntary sector moving forward. And um, certainly within my department, I know that there are officials who are working on a, 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 some sort of strategy moving forward so that we can identify you know, those really fantastic community and voluntary groups out there who are providing a service to our community, let's face it, on our behalf. And um, it's, 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 an, it's an important concept moving forward, one which I hope you know, the, the executive will fully realise when we uh, have an action plan moving forward on our programme. Well, Ms Nicola Mallon. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, may I ask the Minister, accepting um, her comments about the operational aspect of the Lock and Island report, and that being a matter for the Ombudsman, and also accepting genuinely that, you're coming from, uh, that the Minister is coming from a very compassionate place in this, but does the Minister agree with the Secretary of State's description um, that collusion is a pernicious counter-narrative, or does the Minister agree with all of those thousands of people who have signed the petition because they find that they profoundly disagree with the Secretary of State's comments and are also find it deeply, deeply offensive? I, I thank the member for her question. Um, I do say that the use of language that you use you know, should be very much um, carefully considered um, because you know, this is a very, very emotive um, and rightly so um, issue that we're dealing with here. And I, I think um, some of the comments that are made do need to be considered in that respect, you know, in, in mind of the victims more than anything else and their families. And um, it's, it's, it's something that you know, I would certainly take care of in the language that I use. Well, Ms. Mullen for a supplementary. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, uh, part of the response to dealing with collusion lies in inquests. Can I therefore ask the Minister, um, is she pressing for a paper to go to the Executive before recess, focusing in on the release of resource for inquests uh, to give some comfort to the many, many families waiting and waiting? Um, Yes, um, essentially, um, my department certainly is trying to encourage that we do move forward on the legacy inquests. And indeed, the, the Lord uh, Chief Justice um, uh, plan in terms of dealing with all these inquests sooner rather than later is something that my department is very um, supportive of. Um, but again, as I had mentioned to sort of uh, earlier questions, you know, it is something that I think we'll move on. And I, you know, I, I hope it will happen sooner rather than later, but certainly it's something that I, I am encouraging very much within, uh, at the executive table. Call Mr. John O'Dowd. Um, welcome the Minister to our, to our post uh, and wish her well. Uh, as we approach um, the marching season and the bonfire season and acknowledging that there was a lot of work carried out in the PLU community to reduce tensions, particularly around bonfires, uh, will the Minister agree with me that it's still unacceptable that we see posters, effigies, images being burnt on, on bonfires? <clears throat> I, uh, I thank the member for his question. Yes, of course, it's unacceptable. All incidents of hate crime are unacceptable, whether it be sectarian or, or racism. And indeed, uh, those people um, who are responsible for that type of um, activity do need to be held accountable for it. You know, and certainly, um, again, that's a role for the police to, to investigate and uh, move forward. But yes, of course, you know, I, I, any incidents of hate crime are not acceptable. Uh, sorry, Mr. Sorry, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank the Minister for her answer. There is a number of sites which have become notorious with this. We have Ballycraigie Road in Antrim, Dublin Road in Antrim. We have seen even in my own constituency in Bambers and Porter Down the continuing burning of posters and effigies. Would the Minister not agree with me that the PSNI should treat this more seriously and indeed treat it as a hate crime? Um, I thank the Minister for his uh, supplementary. Um, if the Minister, or, or, sorry, if, if the member um, does have um, specific incidents, you know, which they feel are, you know, ongoing near and near. I would suggest that he, you know, he, he directs those comments to the PSNI, um, and indeed um, even th uh, through the policing board as well. Um, again, this is an operational matter, which you know, which I do find difficult the commenting on, and indeed it would not be appropriate for me to do so. But you know, just to reiterate, you know. Incidents of hate crime are really unacceptable, and you know I do appreciate um, you know where you're coming from. So certainly, in terms of trying to deal with this particular issue, I would I would certainly direct the, the member to the PSNI. Call Mr. Sidney Anderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I also welcome uh, the minister to our first question time? Uh, minister, we've already touched on a previous question in relation to uh, legal aid costs, and uh, I note from the report uh, released today that there's. For four years, from 2011 to 2015, there was uh, a yearly increase uh, taking place, and I do know you refer to maybe that this year the 15-16 was 92 million. But uh, can I ask uh, that the reforms that were being brought in at that time, uh, why have those reforms uh, not delivered, and do you think much more needs to be done? I, I thank the member again for his good wishes and um, his, his question. Um, I, I can appreciate why people you know, would think that legal aid is perhaps, uh, the reforms to legal aid are perhaps not being, ha perhaps being fully realised in the way that it was always set out to do. Um, but a number of reforms um, have been impl implemented up to, to, to date. A number of reforms haven't been implemented up to date. Um, and I do think it's a fair point to say that, you know, that 
£19 million pounds will be, uh, in terms of savings will be realised when uh, they are fully implement, uh, implemented. So, d does that suggest that you know, we, we should be looking in, you know, to further reforms, perhaps? You know, this this is a, is a new mandate you know, with um, new representatives and new opinions, and I'm uh, more than happy to, uh, to listen to the views of people who think that maybe we need to go further in terms of legal aid. And, and, um, from my perspective, legal aid should very much be about helping the most vulnerable in society get access to justice. Access to justice, I think, is my overarching aim of what we intend to do in this area. And um, certainly, you know, if, if that means looking you know, at the current process, well, then I, you know, I, I think that's something that we should certainly explore. Mr. Anderson, time for a quick supplementary and time for a quick uh, answer. Thank the Minister, the Minister. For, that, for that response, indeed, Minister. But as, as one who sat on the Justice Committee in the previous mandate, when uh, I sat in many debates in relation to this, would you now agree that much more does need to be done to bring that legal aid bill further down? Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I, I think it's something we should certainly look at. Table.